Good morning, Magna 2014. How's everyone doing this morning? Everybody survived uh, the parties last night? All right, see everybody's got their coffees and uh, we're ready to get a little bit of learning on. Um, when I try to put together the speaker talks, I try to come up with a selection of topics and some of them are really cute, lean back, uh, you know, picture, pictograph kind of presentation. And uh, a couple other talks will require you to put your thinking cap on and lean forward and actually learn something. This is one of those talks. You want to learn, you want to know stuff about LEDs? Um, this is the talk to do it. This is uh, Nick Place of Build My LED. And he actually spoke at uh, Reefstock 2014 earlier this year. And um, the fire hose of information that he uh, gave us about LED lighting was uh, quite eye-opening, even though I've worked with LEDs for a long time. So I'm really excited about our next speaker and help me in uh, welcoming Nick Clace. Morning. Can everybody hear me? We on? Yeah, so we have, uh, I prepared like 30 minutes worth of slides here. And so if I'm going to go really fast, because there's probably about six hours worth of content I'm going to try to get through. So the fire hose is a good application or uh, analogy for this. Uh, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Build My LED. Uh, it's really great to be here at MACNA. We actually launched the business 23 months ago at MACNA Dallas. That Friday that the show started was actually our very first day to go into business. So MACNA is a really special place for us. So the talk I'm going to give today is really about LEDs in general, not promoting our LEDs, but just LEDs in general, because we get phone calls every single day about people wanting to go turn their tank over to LED, and there's so many questions. So this presentation is pretty much all of those questions, trying to answer them preemptively. Um, so we're not going to make it through all of the content today, but we do have a booth here, and so we'll be here till 4 o'clock when the show shuts down. So if anybody does have questions, probably won't have a lot of time for Q&A in here, but we'd love to have you come by and uh, ask us over there. So here's a fun picture of me in college in the late 90s, posing with my first reef tank. And uh, it was late 90s, so I kind of get a vanilla ice vibe out of this picture, even though it was a few years after that. But I, I put this up here because I am uh, an aquarium hobbyist. I've had fish tanks since I was about five years old. And uh, so first and foremost, we are hobbyists at the company, and we really love uh, being a part of this crowd. Also, on the freshwater side, to this day, if you go to simplydiscus.com, if anybody's ever kept discus, anybody in here, possibly? If you go to simplydiscus.com, which is the, uh, probably the best site on the internet for discus, uh, my old breeding pair, I used to breed discus, the, the red pair that you see down here under the breeding and genetics tab. That was my a pair of fish with some spawn around them. So to this day, I kind of have still a little bit of fish out there. So here's some of the fish when in my, one of my raise out tanks back in 2004 or 2012 or 2002, 2004. I was doing, uh, like I said, discus breeding at my house, like part time. And I've since got into uh, baby breeding uh, in the last couple of years. Um, if you haven't tried it, it's much better than the fish breeding. So highly recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my daughter. She was born 21 days ago. This is Lillian. So uh, thank you. This is my co-founder, Randy, and myself at our factory in Austin, Texas, where we build all of our lights. Uh, he and I met at a company called Illumitex, which was an LED manufacturing company. So we had a plant in Penang, Malaysia, and we actually built the LEDs. Uh, so we know quite a bit about the LED itself. Uh, previous to that, I spent about a decade at Acuity Brands Lighting, which is the largest lighting company in North America. And my co-founder comes from more on the semiconductor computer side of the business. So um, what we're going to talk about today, it's three parts of the talk. The first one is how do LEDs work? There's a lot of misinformation about LEDs, actually what they are. And so we're really going to break it down and kind of really dive into the very heart of an LED and explain how they work. And then two, we'll bring that back to the reef aquarium and talk about how does an LED and all of that that we learn about LEDs apply to the aquarium. And we're also doing some uh, research right now on wavelengths and corals and try to give you an update of where we're at with all of that. So part one, how do LEDs work? So what's an LED? So if I had you close your eyes and just picture an LED, some people may picture a low power indicator type LED like this, maybe a Christmas tree light. If you've ever built your own LED system, maybe you picture a Cree high power LED. If you're Jake Adams and you know a whole lot about LEDs and you're big into the reef, -er, um, this may be what you picture. Yeah. I don't just pick on Jake, though. I know that uh, Sanjay, why well, he's been testing those high power, high power lights for 
a long time. And so, uh, so how does an LED work? So that's a picture of an LED. This is uh, made by Philips, a company called LumaLEDs, a really popular LED manufacturer. So the LED is actually a semiconductor that emits light when you apply current or a voltage to it. So when you say an LED, a lot of people picture that over there, but the LED itself is actually an extremely complex little part. And there's pretty much five steps to it. And when somebody says an LED, they could be referring to many different layers here. So the first step, an LED is actually, obviously it's a man-made object and it starts on a substrate. And then they put what we call an epitaxial layer on it. So in the industry, you call it the epi layer. The third piece is that is then dissected up into a little LED, the chip, the actual diode that's gonna emit light. That's then packaged into what we call the LED package, which is what you see over on the left. So a lot of people, when you think of an LED, you're actually thinking about that package there. And of course, then we put that into the light fixture that we put over our aquarium to light the corals. So the substrate, this is part one. So most of the uh, substrate that the LEDs are actually grown on are typically is made by uh, a sapphire material. And we actually have some, I brought some show and tell. So if you wanna stop by the booth later and actually see the different stages of LEDs, so we actually have some sapphire wafers here at different stages of processing. Uh, so the two inch wafer, I have a two inch wafer and a three inch wafer that you can take a look at. You can see the push in the industry is to go to bigger wafers because you're gonna get higher yields and LED prices will go down and cost of LED fixtures will go down. But uh, this is the first step. And so sapphire is an extremely hard substrate and so that's why they start with uh, using that uh, sapphire. So that's sapphire, and you can see some of the wafers here over here stacked up. That's going to be put into a machine called an MOCVD. It's a, about a million dollar machine, very expensive. And so we're going to put that sapphire disc into this machine. And this, basically, we're going to start uh, applying different uh, materials. And with most LEDs used in the reef, the material that we're going to use, it's a compound semiconductor. And we're going to use gallium, and we're going to use nitride. So it's called a gallium nitride, or in the industry, you call it a GAN material. And it's actually, this machine is so sophisticated, it actually lays down the GAN in a one atom layer, thick layer at a time. It's highly precise. And so if there's any defects in that crystalline structure, you're gonna get less power. It's gonna be a less efficient LED. So it's a very, very expensive machine, and to do this is extremely complicated. And so when it comes out of this machine, the color of the disc is gonna look, a bit, the, the substrate's gonna look a little bit different because it has the GAN on it, so it's gonna have a very shiny type surface on it. So if we took that disc at that point, after it's been processed, and we kind of looked at it from the side, like from a sandwich view, this is what you're going to see. So we call the epi stack. So on the, the lower part, that gray material here, that's the sapphire. That's the actual substrate. And up top is the layers that have been deposited through that machine. And the two most important, you can see where it says PGAN and NGAN. That's your gallium nitride. There's two stacks. And in between, there's something called the quantum well. That's where all the magic happens within the LED. So as electrons flow through this LED, electrons, once they go into that quantum well, if they fall into what we call an energy hole, they fall into a lower state of energy and they throw off a photon. That photon is the light that you're giving to your corals. So that's basically the heart of what's happening here. So it's an extremely sophisticated process and something we just take for granted, but it's actually some really cool stuff. So this picture was actually taken by a scanning electron uh, 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 microscope. So it's a, a super duper zoomed in layer of pretty much what you're seeing on the left. So instead of a graphic, this is actually the real epi layer. So on the bottom, the aluminum oxide, that's your man-made sapphire. And then up top, again, you see your PGAN, the quantum well. So this is some really cool stuff that uh, it's, it's so far removed from like when Edison invented the light bulb. So, I mean, this is really high-tech stuff that we're playing with with LEDs. Uh, some companies to try to extract more of those photons out of the LED itself will come up with these really cool shapes that they put on top of the LED surface to try to extract more of those photons. Because just because the photon was created, in the LED doesn't mean it's actually going to get out and into your fish tank. So they come up with these really cool uh, processes to roughen up the surface. And uh, here's what the LED, see the little squares within the disc itself? Those are the actual LED chips before this disc is cut up and then actually placed into the LED package. And again, we have one of these here if you want to stop by, but it's probably got about 600 LED chips all within a two little or two inch wafer. So when you talk about an LED, this is what most people think about. This is a, a kind of a, a cut layer view of it. So everybody knows the little squishy lens on top of the LED, that's your silicon lens. That's just there to try to extract the light out. But the real heart of it is the red chip there. That's the, uh, the actual LED diode or the computer chip we've created that's gonna emit the light. And here's some finished packaged uh, product here in China with a tip of a match to kind of give you the scale of how small this stuff is getting. 
Now that yellow color under the dome right there, just take a note of that and we'll talk about in a few minutes of why that's actually yellow. So if we were gonna all get on a plane today and do a little field trip and go to Malaysia and look at where your LEDs are actually created, this is what it would look like if you walked into an LED fabrication room. So everybody would be in a clean room suit, or they call them bunny suits, and just, again, really expensive materials. You can see he's working on a large wafer in the lower left-hand corner of the picture. Uh, so it's, it's really cool stuff, really expensive machines and highly controlled. And the scientists that are working on this are some really, really smart people. So how does an LED work? There's, we mentioned the GAN, the gallium nitride. That's the most common type of compound semiconductor you're going to use for the LEDs in the reef aquarium because that's your blue and your UV LEDs are made of gallium nitride up through green. There's another compound uh, material we use called Allen Gap. So if you get into amber wavelengths and red and far red, that's a, actually a different chemistry. But these are spectral charts. So everybody has, you know, is everybody familiar with seeing a spectral chart? Cut all the wavelengths coming out of your LED fixture. So this is a dead giveaway that these are individual diodes. So these are LEDs. So you have a blue or UV LED, a green LED. So you see how they're fairly peaky? So they're not very broadband sources. And remember, there are no such thing as white LEDs. So if you have a reef LED, it's got a white LED in it, but there's, there's actually no such thing as a white LED. And the reason is, is because to make white light, you need the three, three primary colors. You need red, green, and blue. So blue LEDs are actually the most efficient. So if we assume an LED, a blue LED is 100% efficient compared to current state of technology, Red is about 15% less efficient right now, and then green is way down. So in the industry, we call this the green gap. There's probably about a billion dollars at least spent every year for companies trying to solve the green gap. Because if you actually could make a very efficient green LED, you could make a more efficient white light. But because you have this green gap problem, you can't use a red, green, or blue LED to make white. So from the industry perspective, here's how we created that. These are spectral charts from white LEDs. On the top left, that's a cool white LED. In the bottom right, they progressively get to warmer light, like the room uh, lighting in here is a very warm light light. And the dead giveaway that you know this is an LED is you see the big blue peak? That's actually the blue LED. So the LED it chip itself is a blue LED. And remember that yellow material we just talked about and you saw it? That's actually a phosphor coating that's applied over the chip itself. So what happens, the blue light is excited and comes through that phosphor material. And the yellow is actually adding in your green and your red light. So when you get the blue light, some of the blue photons come through from the chip, mixing with the green and the red, you have white light. So the amount of phosphor you put on and the color of the phosphor actually dictates the, is it going to be a cool white light or is it going to be a warm white light? So anytime you see a spectral chart with this blue peak, you know it's an LED light. So in general, that's the crash course of how the LED is actually manufactured. So let's bring it home to the aquarium lighting goals. So people call us all the time and ask us, you know, what do I need and what do I need to think about? So our thought is, number one, you've got to like looking at your tank. So let's, you know, we'll talk about the visual requirements of making sure you like looking at your tank. Then you've got to make sure you're meeting the coral's photosynthetic uh, requirements. So if you have any type of coral, that coral is using that light to actually survive. And then three, the goal should be use the least amount of energy as possible. We want to cut the energy used by converting to LED. So visual requirements. Here's two different type of reef tanks. Uh, Sanjay talked yesterday, and he's a big fan of, is Sanjay in here? Not in here. So he's a big fan of a more of a white light tank. And a lot of people, though, they like really blue, or this, you know, some people joke and call it the bottle of Windex look. Uh, and the more blue that you put into your tank, the more coral pop, that fluorescence, your corals are going to look better. But the tank doesn't look as bright. But first and foremost, make sure you start by selecting a spectrum that you really enjoy looking at. Uh, this is a, a reef tank at the Austin Aquadome, which is one of our reef stores in Austin. So it's the same tank with four different types of our lights that we build, and uh, we hired a photographer to go film it. So in the top left, that's about a 12,000K reef spectrum, then a 14K, and then more of a, a purple-based, and then more of a super actinic type look. So all the same contents in the tank, but just by changing the light, you can drastically change the appearance of that tank. So when we talk about wavelengths and color, this is what the sun spectrum actually looks like. So if you went outside and took a spectroradiometer, we talk about PAR. Is everybody familiar with the term PAR? So PAR is typically defined by wavelengths between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. And it's roughly the same range of the, the light that the human eye can actually sense. Uh, for instance, over here past 800, you see how it's kind of like a pinked out version. There's actually a lot of infrared energy that the human eye can't see. So the human eye is basically seeing what the PAR range is. So this is sunlight, a very full spectrum white light. Now I'm going to show you the same chart, but using a radium metal halide bulb, which is a very, obviously, very popular bulb. 
So here's sunlight, full spectrum. This is a radium, metal halide. So this is a spectral chart we've tested off that fixture. So something, you, obviously the first thing you notice is this has very little green in it and very little red, but a lot of blue. And I think about 74% of the, the spectral uh, characteristics of the radium metal halide is in that blue range. So whenever you see uh, this drop off going from full spectrum to these reef type lights, the reason typically we've done that is number one, I think people like seeing the blue, but also water absorbs different colors at different rates. So this is a, over on the left, an absorption chart of how the different wavelengths are filtered off. So again, the PAR range, basically 400 to 700 nanometers. Over on the right, where it's very steep, a very high line, that basically is telling you red light is filtered out very quickly by water. And conversely, way over on the left, down there like in, in the blue range, which is where the radium power is, water basically doesn't absorb that. So that's why when you go deeper into the ocean, you see the pictures and everything looks blue. It's because that's the light that's actually making it through not being absorbed. So here's some different, four different uh, light sources. So whenever you're looking for a light, you should always look at the spectral chart because it tells you a lot about what you're actually gonna see in your aquarium. So again, noon sunlight in Austin, Texas, no clouds. That's what the sun looks like. Over on the right, again, the dead giveaway that this is LED is because you have a couple peaks in the UV and the blue. Those are the blue LEDs. Over here, you actually see the little red LED bump. That's a red LED. And that big broadband smooth section in the green range, that's your, or your uh, phosphor. The top right is a fluorescent system. It's a very peaky. You get the red, green, and blue peaks from the phosphors inside the tube. And the Ushio 14K metal halide. Again, you can see that it's got a lot of blue, but it actually has a lot more green and red than the uh, radium may have. So apart from looking at the colors in your light, there's also a big phenomenon that we look at called fluorescence. So this is the coral pop, the thing that everybody loves to see in their corals. This actually has nothing to do with the reflected colors that's actually in your light spectrum, but by what we call exciter wavelengths. And this exciter wavelengths in corals is typically in the blue range. So again, if you walk around the show here and you see a lot of these frag tanks, most of the time they have blue lights on it. And the reason is because that's exciting pigments within the coral, and the coral itself is actually becoming a light source. So that's why these pictures right here were filmed under blue colors only, but yet you get greens and pinks and reds. All of those colors are actually being produced by the coral itself. So it's actually a really cool phenomenon. And so you've heard the term a fluorescent light. That's ex exactly how a fluorescent light tube works. A fluorescent light actually generates UV light that you can't see, but it excites phosphors in the red and the green and the blue range to make the white light. So that's visual requirements. On photosynthetic requirements, a couple things you need to look at. One, we're going to do a quick one slide basic photosynthesis refresher. Two, we're going to look at the spectrum that we've just been talking about, the different colors that your corals need. And then three is how much light do you need? So again, everybody talks in PAR, which is the right metric. So PAR is photosynthetically active radiation. Just means that it's light that's going to grow your corals. And we typically define that as between 400 and 700 nanometers. So on the quick one slide photosynthesis refresher, you have your formula up top you probably remember from grade school. And the, the key element inputs into this is we need light, we need carbon dioxide, and we need water. And the end result is we produce oxygen and sugar. So that's a leaf, but the note at the bottom, so when you're talking about corals, that's that symbiotic relationship. So your coral is actually hosting an algae. That algae is actually what's doing the photosynthetic process. In exchange for, I think the number I've heard is maybe around 80% of that glucose it's providing, it gives back to the host coral. So the coral says, hey, I'll give you some space in here. You can come live rent-free, but you just got to, well, not rent-free, you has got to pay. It's got to give the sugar back to the host coral. And so it's that symbiotic relationship. But that's why light is so important. If you take light out of that equation, bad things happen to your corals. So in measuring PAR, this is a tricky thing because uh, there's a lot of bad ways people think that you can measure PAR in your aquarium. So this is one slide, and I'm just going to give you a bunch of different bullets, and hopefully some of these stick. And so things I would say, you, the, let's talk about what you don't want to do. What you don't want to do is use visual brightness as an indicator of how much PAR is in your tank. A lot of people, and maybe some people in this room, tried to do this with LEDs, and you ended up bleaching your coral. We don't want to use a lux meter to measure PAR. In the past, we could use lux meters for measuring white light back when we used maybe fluorescent or metal halide. You can't do that anymore with LEDs. You don't want to use an inexpensive PAR meter to measure PAR. You don't want to use watts per gallon to determine lighting needs. If anybody in the room has ever used that term, watts per gallon, we'll talk about why that's, that's no good. And you don't want to use LED wattage as an indicator of PAR. So a lot of people will walk up to us at the show and say, hey, do you use one watt LEDs? Do you use three watt? Do you use five watt? 
But we don't like answering that question just right out because it really doesn't tell you, the consumer, anything about that lighting system. So really, there's only one thing you do want to do, and you do want to use a properly calibrated PAR meter to measure the PAR in your tank. So let's dive in real quick into some of these things. So why don't you want to use visual brightness to measure PAR? So here's how the human eye responds to different wavelength colors. The way you interpret this chart here, and again, it's basically 400 to 700 nanometers. If I handed you a photon, and I brought up photons on the stage, and I showed you this is a 400 nanometer photon, and I went all the way down the line to 700 nanometers, and I asked you to rank how bright they were, this is the graph you would come up with. At around 560 nanometers, right in the middle of that, you would say that was by far the brightest photon. Because the human eye is just, this is where it senses brightness. The problem with reef tanks is because we talked about this is uh, basically how the coral is going to use that light for photosynthesis. And again, it's very strong down in that blue range, in the UV range. Now look up back to the human vision. The human eye is, struggles to see light in the blue and UV wavelength range. So if you use visual brightness of how bright that tank is to tell you how much PAR that is, you're probably giving way too much uh, PAR to the corals in there. And you probably lead to bad things like bleaching. So measuring PAR, this is the meter that we use. We're a big fan of the Lycor 250A. And then the, uh, these are a couple of the quantum sensors that you would attach to that. And with PAR meters, you really get what you pay for. I, I've looked all over the world, and there is no cheap, good PAR meter. Yet, how many people have ever, how many people in the room know somebody that's ever spent maybe a $500 on a frag? <laughs> yeah. How many people know anybody that's spent $1,500 on a PAR meter? And tell you, in the two years we've been doing this, we've never met somebody that actually has what I would say is the bare minimum PAR meter that you'd want to use for reef tanks. But it's probably the most important piece of equipment if you have a very expensive reef tank and you're spending a lot of money on your corals. You have to know how much light you're giving to your corals. So kind of in summary in there, you don't use electrical watts to compare lights. A lot of people walk up and say, hey, how many, light, how many watts is that light? It doesn't matter. And they'll say, well, what's the wattage of the LED? It doesn't matter. And the reason is these metrics don't tell you anything about how much light you're actually buying. So again, you think about it. Watts don't grow corals. Electricity and water don't match, right? Those aren't mix, they don't mix very well. So you want to talk about how much light you're actually delivering to the corals, not how much electricity is actually going into the fixture. So what you do want to ask that manufacturer to provide are two things. Number one, ask for a PAR map to show you how much PAR is actually going into the tank in an aquarium application at various depths. And then two, ask for how many input electrical watts, meaning don't let them tell you what kind of wattage they're using at the LED. Ask them if you put a watt meter on the end of your light, how many watts are actually coming into your system. Between those two metrics, that's really what you want to look at. And I'll tell you a little bit why. So two months ago, there was a great paper. Uh, we also have a company that we do horticulture lighting systems. And uh, one of the top photobiologists in the country, uh, Dr. Bruce Bugby, his team led a paper in, uh, talking about LEDs and are they ready for greenhouse lighting applications? Are they ready to take on high pressure sodium lights in that market? Uh, Dr. Bugby, he's very well known. He's also the owner of Apogee Instruments. If anybody's ever used an Apogee PAR meter, this is the guy that owns that company. Dr. Bugby's a very, very smart guy. So in two months ago, his team had a peer-reviewed article published in a major journal when they looked at, let's go out and look at the LEDs on the market. Here are the results. And this isn't to toot our horn, but it's to show you so you went out and I think they bought like 10 different LED lights on the open market. And some of these names you may know if you ever do any type of work in horticulture lighting, like Lumigro or Black Dog, Apache, California Lightworks. Uh, and so they, what they did is they bought lights off the open market and everybody claims that they have the best grow light. Well, they sent them out and they put them in about a $100,000 machine that actually counted how many photons come out of the lights. And then they looked at the watt meter, how many watts did it take to produce that light? We ended up winning. We were the number one ranked LED fixture in that market. And when you look at some of these things, there was almost 100% variance in what we call, call PAR efficiency, meaning for every watt of electricity coming into your light, how much PAR was coming out of it. So if you were to use metrics like watts per gallon, and you compared our light versus the one on the other end, you could be putting almost twice as much PAR for the same amount of watts. So that's why we don't want to look at how many watts. Again, you want to look at how much PAR. And that's also why this whole idea of looking, focusing on the watt of the LED is such a bad metric, because it's not telling you anything about this chart up here. You want to be asking, how much PAR is coming out of this fixture, and how much watts did it take? So I'm hoping, I'm doing my part, that these metrics will die a, a quick death. So part three, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, we're doing some really cool work in Hawaii right now, because everybody wants to know, how does light spectrum, PAR aside, like, you know, how much light aside, 
how did the different colors of light impact coral growth rate? And we get that, you know, that question every single day. So we're going to ask that question. And two, we're going to say, what's the most efficient growth spectrum? So uh, let's say you get up in the morning, you turn on your reef tank, and you enjoy it, and then you go to work. Well, what light should be on during the day to actually get the most growth when you're not actually there looking at it? So we're going to look at, hey, what happens if you use some really ugly lights? Can you actually grow your corals faster? And then when you come back home, use something that makes the tank look better. So one of the questions I'm interested in is, are we using too much blue light in your reef aquarium? Are we using too little green light? And is red light harmful to corals? So there was an article published uh, out of Europe not too long ago, maybe three, four months ago, talking about the impact of red light on corals. So we're going to kind of deep dive in, in our research and look at some of these things to try to answer these questions. So the overview, what we're going to do is we have a 240-gallon reef tank with four dividers in it. So all of the parameters in this tank are exactly the same except for the light spectrum. So intensity the same, flow is the same, nutrients are the same, everything the same just the light color. So we're providing the lighting systems. Uh, Dana Riddle, who some of you may know, he's actually conducting the experiments. And we should have some initial results uh, early next year to talk about. So what are we going to test? Uh, one, we have four different colors. One, we're going to look at a pure actinic source. So this uh, wavelength, we're using a lot of UV, royal blue, and blue, which is a very co common color. Again, walk the show. A lot of people are lighting their tanks with this. So these corals are pretty much going to get no green, no red. They're just going to get blue light. Two is we have a spectrum that we call our 20,000K reef spectrum that was basically created to mimic the radium metal halide. And so uh, step three is going to be a really ugly color. This is just 6,500 Kelvin cool white light. It's, you, know, you could buy this at Home Depot, very common color. And the last one, we actually, on our horticulture uh, company, we have a product called the Solar Max. So it's an LED spectrum that was built to mimic sunlight. So we're going to look at the impact of, all, again, all in the same tank, same type of coral. Same, uh, Dana will harvest these out of the ocean. He has a license to do that. So everything should be the same except for the color of the light. And we're going to look at how does this impact coral growth and health. And a quick snapshot of the spectrum content of those four lights that we're going to be using. Again, the actinic source is pretty much 99% in the blue range. The 20K, again, 74% of the power is in the blue range. 16% green, 9% in the red with a pinch of far red light. Now you look at this, the cool white light, which would be like your garage shop light. Almost half of that light is in the green range and dropped down to 28% in the blue and a lot more red. And the Solar Max, which is our product that was, we created uh, for some university researchers in the U.S. Department of Agriculture to replicate sunlight in controlled experiments. Look at this. It's completely different than anything else we're using today in the reef tank. So 34% green, 34% red, 26% blue, and then the far red balance. Give you a couple other reference points that you have may have used in the past. Has anybody ever used the Iwasaki 6500? Yeah. Did you get good growth results? Yeah. So everybody I've talked to about this lamp said, that thing grew my corals better than any other light I've ever used, but it looked absolutely terrible in my tank. Well, look at look the, the, the spectrum down there. Notice how it looks very similar to the Solar Max or to the sunlight right next to it? So a lot of green content. And when you start adding that green into your tank, your reef starts looking really brown, really yellow, really gross. So in fact, somebody told me their quote was, it grew my corals better than any product I've ever used, but it looked like I peed in my fish tank every day before I went to work. So, <laughs> But again, so my theory is with LEDs and being able to color control and shift spectrum, what is the right spectrum to have on during the day? So when you come home, you can go back to the colors that you like looking at. But you know, should we be using that all day long? Again, sunlight, you can see right here, it's a very balanced spectrum as well. But some people will say, well, Nick, you had that slide earlier talking about the red light gets filtered out very quickly. So we also uh, recently worked with the University of Miami researchers in their marine uh, department. And they wanted us to create a spectrum for them that mimics sunlight 15 feet below the surface. And so you can see how the red, look at the middle chart down here, 32% of the content was red. 15 feet down, you're already down to 13%. It's getting, and the, the far red was almost eliminated completely. So we're looking at how does that change? You can see that blue gap starts growing. So we're going to start looking at, well, this is one reference point. 15 feet under the ocean. I was talking to one of the guys from a coral company yesterday. Asked him, you know, with scolies and the different types of corals, like at what depths are we finding these things? And uh, so we can start to look at maybe in the future when you're keeping a certain type of coral, if we can analyze in nature. I always look to nature. What thrives in nature? And can we mimic that with our technology in our tank? So the last slide I have for you here is these are the spectral charts of those four uh, 
LEDs that we're using. You can see the actinic source has a UV peak at 400, and then you see the 450 royal blue, and then the kind of the 470 slope on the right. So it's a, just basically three bands of blue light. The 20K looks very similar to that radium spectrum that we saw earlier. So it has the UV, the blues, and then the phosphor to give the green and the red. The cool white you see right in the middle, I got a little laser, it's not very bright here. The big peak in the green bump, that's why that picture of the coral starts to look very green. And then over here, solar max. So the sun is a very flat spectrum that you saw earlier. So this is throwing a lot of different colors at the corals, and we're going to see what happens there. So 32 minutes, I bet. So. Any questions there?